Um, we've had a huge response to this event topic uh, and it's understandable uh, given that rates of mental illness are on the rise and now represent a larger share of the mental health burden worldwide. Most of us in this room has or know someone who has experienced mental illness. And this raises the, qu the question of whether we're approaching the, the issue of well-being and happiness in the right ways. And is happiness just an elusive goal? So let's find out um, what some of the academics and, and writers think. Um, I would like to introduce our panel. Um, on the far end is Associate Professor Brock Bastian, a school, school, social psychologist and author of The Other Side of Happiness from Melbourne School of Psychological Sciences. Dr Peggy Kern, Senior Lecturer at the Centre for Positive Psychology from Mel uh, the Melbourne Graduate School of Education. Professor Mark Wooden, Director of the HILDA Survey Project, Australia's first large-scale household panel survey at the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research. And Ms Jill Stark, author of Happy Never After, Why the Happiness Fairy Tale is Driving Us Mad and How I Flipped the Script. <laughs> Welcome to you all. Um, <laughs> Brock, I'd like to start with you. In the Western world, it, it often seems we're in the midst of a mental health epidemic. Um, and so as a social psychologist, do you believe that there has been a real rise in mental health issues? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, so you, you started with the hardest question first, yeah. I feel. Um, <laughs> so, so, I mean, the data, the data seems to suggest, in, in, in the, at least since about the 1990s, in the last 20 or 30 years, it actually seems to have plateaued a little bit in terms of the rate of mental illness reported around the world. Um, but as you pointed out before, the percentage of uh, the world health burden or, or the overall health burden, it, it is going up. So it seems as though um, we're certainly not treating it as well as we might be treating other things. Um, and, and the other thing that's interesting is that the use of antidepressants is also going up. So it's sort of a complex answer, to, I, I think, in some ways. I think that, you know, we're certainly on, in the news, we're hearing things about you know, anxiety at the moment really becoming quite prevalent. Um, so I think, you know, anecdotally, it seems like it, there, there is this, this outcrop of or, or sort of rise in, in mental health issues. At the same time, some of the data is suggesting it's plateaued. I think before, you know, before 20 or 30 years ago, there certainly was, or did appear to be some rises going on there. So, um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a I, I wonder whether, um, you know, part of what we're seeing is also how we're, how we're responding to that as well, how people are coping with that. And again, the tendency to be, I, I guess, reaching or using uh, antidepressants perhaps um, at a higher rate, an increased rate, maybe says something about that too. Mm. Mm. Well, I'm sure we'll touch on that mm. later as well. So, Jill, um, you speak about your personal experience in your recent book um, and of your struggles with mental health. You'd been anxious and depressed um, on and off throughout your childhood, teenage years into your adulthood. Um, can you just give us a sense of what that's been like for you? Yeah, I could, I could tell you what that's like. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, anxiety is something I've struggled with since I was a teenager. Even now, like this sitting here, like looking at all your lovely faces, it's still quite terrifying for me. But you, um, I can't see you all at the back, but I, I think that you're all not going to, to harm me, even though my fight or flight response would tell me otherwise. I think anyone who struggles with anxiety would know that this kind of um, situation can be quite challenging. And I spent the last three months touring this book and it's still a challenge, but I'm getting there. And so I think the reason that I like to have, to, to go to these events is to show that, you know, this is something that we all struggle with. For me, um, I was probably 16 when I was diagnosed with depression for the first time. Um, and I think that that label was, was in some ways quite a, a burden. And I look at a lot of that in, in the book and, and how that kind of shaped me. I was a very anxious child much, much earlier than that. I didn't really know what that was about, but you know, that kind of morphed into an anxiety disorder. It's something I've struggled with, yeah, as I say, 
throughout my life. Um, and then I wrote my first book, uh, High Sobriety, and that was, it, it went far, it, it sold really well and it was received very well and it was a kind of a dream come true. And I, and I thought, you know, um, that was it, that happiness was going to be mine and everything would be tied up with a neat bow and it turned out to be quite different. I suffered quite a serious breakdown. I think we still call it that. I don't know if we call it that anymore. But I, I like to see it as a breakthrough, not a breakdown in the end. But um, yeah, and I think that's what I explore in this book is what, what does it mean to be happy and all of the things that I thought would bring me that happiness were actually kind of red herrings. So um, although mental health is, is still a challenge for me, uh, I think that ultimately what I've come to in this book is a, a much more of a hopeful message, I think, and, and realizing that it's okay to not be okay um, mm. and that happiness is not at all what we, or well, certainly for me, what I, what I thought it was, and accepting that. And accepting that, I think, Brock, you talk about this a lot in, in your work um, and in your book, that the, the idea that we should be happy as our default position as humans is actually what gets us into a lot of trouble. Mm. And I think that's where a lot of our struggles come from, is that denial of reality. Not that we should always be suffering, but I think the Buddhists have got it right by saying that, that, that life is suffering, and that's, that's not a depressing statement. To me, it's quite liberating, and it's realizing that, that to be fully alive, fully awake, and fully human is to experience the entire facet of human emotions, and happiness is just one of those. Mm. Well, we'll go further into that too. That's very rich pickings, I think. Um, Mark, I'm interested in whether the trends of over time support this concept of a, a mental illness epidemic from your survey. Yeah, okay. So I just begin by saying uh, I run something called the HILDA survey, as been said before, that's the stands for the household income labour dynamics. Um, it has a strong emphasis on uh, work and income and family. Essentially, it's a study of life in Australia. When you do that, you can't avoid asking people about how they feel in life, about the satisfaction, about their mood, etc. So it's, it's a very wide study. Uh, we, mean follow, we now follow something like 18,000 Australians. We've been doing it, they follow the same ones every year since, uh, almost the same ones, because um, you marry someone, we add your new spouse. You have children, we add your children. Okay, so we've been doing that since 2001, asking the same questions. And so one of the very simple questions we ask just is how satisfied are you with your life? Not quite the same as happiness, satisfaction, on a scale of naught to 10. And in the latest survey, two thirds of Australians are picking eight, nine or 10. And another quarter are picking six or seven. So, so not great, but on the upper end of the scale. Only 7% of Australians are picking a very low score, okay, so expressing some dissatisfaction. So that seems good. It's not quite the same as happiness. But at the same time, we also include these sort of measures of anxiety and mood. That they're self-reported, they're not clinical diagnosis at all. And just in the most recent years, actually we can date it. It's 2009, 10, around that period sort of coincidental with, you know, sort of some economic troubles at the time. And uh, the measure of the, using the Kessler K10 measure of people that, who have uh, symptoms of anxiety and mood disturbance are being high to psychological stress, that's noticeably increased. I mean, from a small proportion, from sort of 5% to 7%, but quite a noticeable increase, something to be worried about. At the same time as the proportion of people who are saying they're, you know, content, content with their life, is remaining very high and, if anything, slightly rising. So you've got this interesting, interesting conundrum. It's interesting, isn't it? Because it seems almost um, counterintuitive that, on one hand, people are satisfied with their life. On the other hand, more mental illness is being reported. Yeah, well, more anxiety, at least. More I, mean, I think we do have to remember that it's a survey, mm. and so we are missing some people. Not everyone responds to surveys, and um, I suspect, well, we know that people with some of the most serious problems are likely the sorts of people who are not responding and participating in, in big surveys, no matter how large we are, and no matter how much we pay them. We do pay them. You do? Yeah, we do. So, <laughs> so that's to make sure we get those low-income people in who are, who are obviously typically averse to surveys, but, but uh, are, respondent, are mm. much more responsive mm. to the financial incentive. And I wonder, Brock, if this is related to, you look into the pressure that we have on us in today's society to be happy. Um, tell us what some of the research has shown you about what that pressure does to us. Yeah, I think, I mean, in, in a sense, it's kind of interesting. We have, this, we have this sort of value system that we've placed on top of our emotional states. As Jill said, you know, we have this whole range of emotions we've evolved to feel. And somewhere along the way, we decided that half of those were, were positive and half of those were negative, which is itself interesting because actually the right, the right way of just you know, referring to them as pleasant and unpleasant 
which isn't really positive and negative, but we sort of have this overlay of it. And so that, that really shapes how we respond to those emotions. And I think that overlay isn't just something we've all each individually come up with, but I think it's something which is communicated in our society more broadly. It's a, a set of cultural norms around this. So, so it, does, it does communicate that, you know, being on the positive side of that emotional spectrum, that, you know, that the 50% of it that's, that, that's pleasant seems to be the place that we should be in order to be successful and, and to, to be achieving things in life, to be getting ahead, to be someone who's worth knowing. Um, and and that, that tends to set up something which is really quite unachievable. Um, and it also sets up, uh, in a way, uh, a, uh, that devaluation of, of the negative side of that spectrum or the unpleasant emotions. And so then when, when we inevitably slip from you know, what we think we should be feeling, which is the, the positive stuff, we inevitably slip over into the negative stuff, then we, that, that, frame, that framework leads us to respond quite badly to that then. We start to feel depressed about the fact we're feeling depressed today, or we get anxious about the fact we've had an anxious feeling. We, we panic about, you know, having panic attacks. So in a sense, it's, it's sometimes it's that, it's that secondary response, and it's the way that we frame those, those, that negative affect which really determines how we, how we sort of get through life. And I suppose that pressure to stay on the positive side of the spectrum is part of what's leading us to sort of devalue and see these other things as, I guess, an, a hindrance. You know, whenever we've, we slip down, we're, we're, we're seen as a hindrance to being where we should be, where we need to be, where, where, where society wants us to be. Mm. Yeah. Jill, you experienced that very much, didn't you? Mm. That you were left, I think you said you were um, left devastated and void. Yeah, I, I described it as a sort of... Um, a deep emptiness, which sounds very depressing. It's a it's a really hopeful book, honestly. It is. It's not. It's not. It's not a tale of woe. Well, it's a tale of um, I think from despair to clarity. Not not. I think the books that I I saw out there in the self help market were very much sort of like a phoenix rising from the ashes, and it was always like you'd you'd kind of catch anxiety and depression like a cold, and then you'd you'd have a couple of sessions of CBT, and you'd emerge unscathed and cured. Um, I think. Life is not not like that. So for me, I realised that it's it's a journey from from really not understanding myself to 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 clarity around what makes me tick and what makes us tick as humans, and that has has led to a much more sense of of comfort with my discomfort when I when I experience it. Um, yeah, for me, exactly as Brock says, the the expectation that I should be happy and I should be at the top of my game because all of the things that were meant to make me happy, I had them. I'd just, you know, written a best-selling book. I, I bought my own apartment. Um, I was dating a footballer. That arguably is not a good thing. But, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, and on, honestly, I've written 100,000 words about my deepest pain in the human condition, and all people want to know is which, which football player you sleep with. But anyway, take that one to my grave. Um, so, yeah, I had all of these things that were meant to, to make me happy, and yeah, I had this yawning chasm inside me of, of why do I feel so empty, and, and that's what I unpack in this book, but it, the expectation that we should be happy all the time, or that we should reach these life goals, and I, you know, we, we, we plan for the, for the birth, not the baby, the, 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 the wedding, not the marriage, it's, it's, we're always plodding along to this sort of end point, and I reached my end point, and I was like, well, what else is there, and I think, you're very much the more aspirational we are, the more we want, and the, the research really backs that up. Like the, the average amount of money that you need to, to reach levels of happiness is 75,000 US dollars. Um, anything above that, there's no material gain in your happiness scores. So once you've got the basics that you need for happiness, so like food and shelter and the sense of belonging, you, you don't really, money's not going to buy that for you. Success is not going to buy that for you. Um, the adulation of people around you, the external validation that we get from social media, I think once I stripped all of that back and it was sort of this sort of gravity-defying limbo that I was left in where I was like, okay, that's not working anymore. What, what do I need? And, and that was what I embarked on in this, in this book in the last few years is trying to figure out, well, what is it that makes us happy? And in the end, what I discovered is we're asking the wrong question. Um, as, as you said, it's not about happiness, it's satisfaction or a sense of fulfillment or a sense of, of being rewarded or, or having a rewarding life and a whole life. And a whole life means that you are going to experience sadness and disappointment and frustration and anger. And unfortunately, we, we, we teach kids that that's not normal. Um, my, my parents from a very early age said to me, um, you know, I grew up in Scotland in a, in a perfectly you know, affluent um, middle-class 
background and they said, we just want you to be happy. <laughs> That's what parents say to their kids as a, as a way of unconditional, an, uh, an expression of unconditional love. And it, I think maybe we need to sort of reframe that because that, that gave me as an anxious child the expectation that I should be happy all the time. And when I wasn't, I thought there was something wrong with me. Mm. So Peggy, you're um, an academic in the Centre for Positive Psychology. Um, even that concept, positive psychology, is a bit pressurising. <laughs> Tell us about the concept of positive psychology and, and how it approaches some of these issues where raising. Yeah, certainly. So I think the, the question I get the most when I say, you know, I, I study positive psychology and people are like, as opposed to negative psychology. <laughs> and so I just come back and say, no, I'm a negative psychologist who studies well-being. <laughs> uh, so, so, so positive psychology is an area of, of research and practice that focuses on bringing out optimal development and functioning in individuals, organizations, communities. And so, uh, when we look through history, across a lot of fields, much of the focus has been on fixing dis dysfunction. In psychology, a lot of it has been treating mental disorder and the challenges that are there. And that's a lot of important work has happened through that. In medicine, it's a lot about restoring uh, health or normal functioning. Um, and a couple decades ago, uh, the fields came about to say, well, we know a lot about how to help to kind of restore normality, but we actually don't know what it means to actually live well. And so the field is really formed around this idea of what does it actually mean to live well, um, to not just simply survive life, but to really thrive. And, and I, I use the word um, optimal function um, because I think optimal is actually very different than actually being happy all the time. It actually means that we can actually handle both the ups and downs of life. It's actually accepting that all of that is actually a part of things. So it's actually more about a full life. And so as part of that, that's actually understanding what that actually means for you and those around you and how we actually move towards that. I do think actually one of the, one of the, the biggest problems I see oftentimes in positive psychology is there's a huge misconception that it's all about happiness. Uh, it's, and even when I started in this whole area, I, I really had this perception that it's just this happyology. It's that there, there are people that just smile all the time, it doesn't really matter what has happened. Um, but it's, it's really much, and I, and I think even why we have to have some of these conversations about the problems of that pursuit of happiness is because of some of those misconceptions that have actually gone on. Um, and, but really, it's about saying, well, we actually want to understand all of human functioning, um, both the positives and negatives. For those who are struggling, how can we help you feel better? For those who are doing well, um, you know, how can we actually help support that um, as we kind of navigate the seas of life? Mm. So, and you're looking um, quite closely at young people. What's your sense of uh, the mental well-being of young people, and and what are the factors that are playing into perhaps challenges for for young people? Yeah. So, so, uh, and, and I think with some st statistics, it's actually kind of challenging to say, well, kind of what are the statistics that we're hearing all of the time versus some of the pressures that young people are dealing with. Um, it, it is a, ch a Adolescents and childhood and whatnot, there's always been different challenges that are there. Um, with things like social media and technology and whatnot, uh, we are seeing uh, the, the, the pace of things has sped up very much, uh, whereas things like mental health and whatnot might have been more of a private matter before. Now it can actually be broadcast around the, uh, around the globe instantaneously. Uh, such that people's entire lives can actually be on display. So this is creating some different pressures um, on some of our young people. Uh, we're also seeing some changing family structures, uh, societal structures and whatnot. We're seeing many more single, single parent families, uh, different structures. Uh, we're much more mobilized, and so you have people where you used to have multiple generations living together or in small, small close connected communities. You're seeing a lot more isolation going on, both within families and across families. 
So these are creating some different pressures. Um, within the schools themselves, uh, we see different pressures on young people around performing on exams. We are seeing a lot of pressures around academic performance. Um, over the past sort of decade, there's been the rise of high stakes testing, things like NAPLAN and other tests like that, that uh, even though we say we want our young people to be happy, we kind of, uh, we, we bring that alongside of you'll be happy if you achieve well on this exam, and if you get into the right uni, and if you get the right, right job, and sort of all those what should happen in life. And so when you're a young person, number one, there's that pressure to actually reach that perception. And number two is the challenge of what happens when you feel like you're not actually on track with that. And I think oftentimes the pressure that's on young people to perform is not actually explicit because I don't think we actually recognize it's the pressure that we're putting on young people or even the expectations that we have, but it's actually ingrained in how kind of some of the values of our society. Um, so there's a lot of different factors that are converging together to create some different pressures on both our young people and those who work with them as well. Mm. Um, and Jill, in your book, you refer to the, that um, pressure from social media as the, uh, the fairy tale filter. It's a comparison culture. We're comparing ourselves to others all the time and often unfavorably. Mm. Um, that was a real, that was a pressure for you as well, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I do want to stress that I, I don't think that the evidence is there to suggest that social media is causing our mental health problems, but I think for those of us who are struggling, it can exacerbate. And certainly for me, I, mean, and I, think, I think the research is good around that, around if you're already displaying depress, depressive symptoms, then, then Facebook and Instagram can be quite problematic. For me, um, social media was, when I was quite unwell, I had to take myself off all of it because I realized that um, fighting with News Corp columnists on Twitter was a bit of a canary in the coal mine for my mental health. So I, I, um, that was one of the things where the compulsive nature and the, the angry shouty nature of platforms like Twitter were not particularly helpful for me, but Facebook and Instagram, even though, you know, I was at this, at this time a few years ago, like, you know, in my late 30s and, and, and completely on an intellectual level understood that what I was seeing on Facebook was was put through the Facebook uh, fairy tale filter and and everyone's but everyone just seemed so happy and everyone seemed to belong and everyone seemed so normal and everyone seemed so sane and there was me completely unable to 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 work as a journalist and and just feeling like I was completely abnormal and so uh, and I just had to take a break from it um, and I think I, I have two nieces who are, who are teenagers and I think for them like they they don't know any other other way and I, I don't think it's it's um practical to say that we shouldn't have social media but I think we just need to to understand that if it's if it's hard for us as as adults then it's it's going to be increasingly difficult for young people and and so that that I, I try very much through my own social media now. I try to be less compulsive. I'm definitely not fighting with people as much on Twitter anymore. Um, and I'm, I try with my Facebook and Instagram posts to be to be very honest and to be to not filter out all of the messy parts of life that make us human because I think that's where where the fairy tale filter can really um, play into that idea that we should be happy all the time and we uh, that's you know my toilet broke recently and I. <laughs> put that on Instagram because I was like, oh, right in the middle of my glamorous author tour, I'm, I've got a plumber and he's charging me $900 to fix my broken toilet. <laughs> so, like, that's, I think, just about being a bit more real about about how life is so that, you know, I, I, as I say in this book, you know, we get, we get to the point now where you have filters. There's, a, there's these apps that you can buy to face tune yourself so that and I'm like, oh, I look amazing. I look like I'm 21. Well, I'm, I'm 42. And that, that's the reality, and we're we're literally jealous of people who don't exist. You know that that's mm. where we're at. So I think just being a bit more honest about it and giving young people the skills that they need to survive in a modern world and to understand that what they're seeing is not real all the time. Mm. So Brock, this is very much a part of your research on pain. This concept of pain. You see, pain is really important. Yeah. Tell us about that. 
Yeah, and I, so I guess I mean the, I mean pain in a broad sense, um, in terms of you know not pleasure. Um, so I, you know, but but also I guess there's, there's a lot of different kinds of pain. Um, but I, but broadly, I think it's what's in, what's important is to start a conversation around you know what are the positive sides of this so so you know seemingly derided set of emotions on the negative side of the spectrum, and what are the sorts of things that these things could do for us. Why would we want them in our lives in the first place? If, if it's not just about getting rid of them, then is there something, you know, is there some benefit to them or is there something we can get from them? And I guess at the, at the broadest level, it's about recognising that, well, inevitably we are going to have these things and in actual fact, if we don't, um, you know, the, the idea of a, an endlessly pleasant, sort of joyous lifestyle full of endless joy, endlessly, um, <laughs> forever, never ending, starts to feel a little bit like it, it isn't quite what you expected. And so, you know, you have to, you start to realise that actually, hang on a sec, that, that goal I've been heading towards isn't really quite what it seems. And I do actually want to have a little bit of the other side of this part of my life in my life. Um, and then, then, you know, when you stop to think about the, how, the way we behave, um, you know, and, and what gives value to our lives, um, you know, a lot of what we do is actually seeking out some of these negative experiences. You know, a lot of, a lot of the most meaningful things aren't very meaningful. You know, it, it doesn't really, it does, it's, not, it's not very exciting to graduate from your degree at university if you couldn't have failed it um, uh, somewhere along the way. You know, it doesn't, there's no sense of achievement there if you didn't take that challenge on with the full knowledge that you could have failed. People run marathons, not because they're pleasant, <laughs> right? I mean, it'd be absolutely pointless running a marathon that was just pleasant. Um, no you know, game, no game, well, exactly, exactly. So <laughs> that, that, that we, we actually find that we, we're, seeking, we're seeking out these experiences more than we realise because they actually give us a lot of pleasure and joy and satisfaction and meaning as well. So I think it's recognising that. And then, and then, of course, there's the other, the other part of it, which is, you know, some of us get stuck in those experiences like, like you know, Jill has told us about. And that's not something we choose, not something you'd want to be, you know, have happen to you. But if all you've got is this... this sort of black box negative view of what you're experiencing, then how can you possibly cope well with it? Yeah. You know, how can, we, how can we teach people to cope well with their negative experiences if all we tell them is, hey, it would be so great if you were happy or feeling more positive, wouldn't it? And that doesn't really give you the tools you need. So it's about understanding, so what, what, what can we take from this? How can we respond to it better? Yeah. Um, and, and recognising that actual fact, we, you know, we, there is some value there. There's some real value there, yeah. And, and there's a sense that um, there, there are real opportunities to build resilience mm. and skills to mm. cope with whatever is yeah, dished it's, out it's next. Yeah, it's very hard to develop resilience if you're not exposed to something which is challenging you. You know, you need, you need something there to press against to to resist against to actually build that resilience in the first mm, place. So mm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I think, a really critical part of that too, yeah. yeah. So th that resilience, Peggy, um, what can you do in, in the educational setting to, to bring that to young people? And, and I think there's a sense that, um, that young people aren't allowed to experience pain or embrace pain. Yeah, so it's been interesting over the kind of past decade or whatever, there's been a rising interest in positive psychology, well-being, this whole space in our schools. I know a lot of schools, well, they now have well-being coordinators and others that are really focused on this well-being space. And I think a lot of that is that reaction and concern over the mental health issues that we're seeing. And we're saying, well, how can we actually help support our young people more? And I think actually part of the challenge of that is that then well-being ends up getting intertwined with happiness. And so we want to have our young people feeling good and it can actually have the unintended consequence of actually harming our young people when they feel a pressure of, I'm supposed to be happy and, and you know, Bobby just broke up with me and I'm not feeling happy, there must be something wrong with me. You know, and so all of a sudden something that should be a normal emotion is actually taken to be something, well, there's an actual problem with me. Um, and, and so one thing we're, we're doing a lot in, in, in the schools is actually saying, well, how can we give our, our young people skills to both understand themselves, but then also manage things well and understand that there is both the highs and lows of things. Um, we see things like uh, building perseverance and resilience. And so there's a lot that we can do both around thinking styles and around behaviors and reaching out to support to understand my own strengths and what are the resources that are actually around me so that uh, it's not just about feeling good all the time, 
but it's actually about, you know, how can I actually sit with that discomfort that's there and move through it so I can actually learn and grow from it as opposed to actually crippling me. And so it's actually working with strategies to actually start to build that sense of resilience as well as some of that acceptance and that knowledge of, you know, when is this something that's okay? When is this, that this something that's beyond me? And so in which case, where can I go for support to actually navigate the, both the challenges within school itself, but then also as you go on in life as well? So Mark, throughout life, um, from your research, what can you tell us about um, which different life events and conditions affect our level of well-being? Uh, well, all life events have the potential to affect that. Uh, in, 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 in any direction. Mm. I mean, in, in the HILDA survey, we can observe all sorts of things happening in people's lives, marriage, divorce, uh, separation, um, going to jail, getting assaulted, um, some major financial shock, adverse event, deaths in the family, deaths of friends. All these things are observed because they happen in people's lives. And I guess the good news is that from the, the people who have, have looked at this particularly, not, not me so, per se, but other users of our data, we have. 3,000 of them around the world um, who are using the data, um, they show that the average person's response to this, that they have some effects, they're, mod they're quite modest, and they rebound quite quickly. So it fits with the idea that people are pretty resilient on average. The average person is well-functioning, is resilient, is able to cope with enormous things in their lives, you know, that sort of, etc. Now, we're not, we can't focus on the most Severe events, you know, the number of people whose you know small child dies unexpectedly is going to be is fortunately very small num numbers in our data, but um, so the good news is that they are very resilient, and it doesn't really matter what event. I mean, the, the ones that had the biggest effect were uh, the deaths in the family, okay, large effects in the short run. And when I say the short run, you know, six months, 12, 12 months, okay, but two two years later, they're reporting similar contentment with life. Okay, this doesn't mean this wasn't a traumatic event and didn't have big effects on their feelings at the time, but they get on with it. So the real issue, I think, is what about the people who don't? Yeah. Okay, so that minority of people who aren't the average, who, who, can't, who struggle to cope, who for whatever reason don't have the coping mechanisms, don't have the support networks, didn't get the right treatment or whatever, and, and then all sorts of bad things can potentially flow from there. And that's a, a, a very difficult area for the type of research that you do, isn't it? To, to really get that the, the complexity. Yeah, I think I'm moving out of my area at this space. <laughs> over to these guys. Uh, yeah. So Jill, you prefer to call, um, rather than call it a breakdown, you would prefer to call it a breakthrough you know, that you had. I sound like some sort of guru, don't I, when I say so that? So um, what happened to you um, triggered a, a journey, really, to, to look more deeply at what had, yeah. had what your life had been up until that point. What path did it take you on? Well, I think what Brock was saying, you know, that you wouldn't choose to have the experiences that, that I had, like sort of acute mental health issues. Actually, I disagree. Um, I wouldn't swap what happened. The only thing that I would change is to spare the people who love me from watching me go through that because I was in a very dark place for quite a while. Um, but that pain that we experience, emotional pain, just like physical pain, it is a warning sign to us. It's, it's an alarm to tell us that something is out of balance. And for me, that was what it was. And I, I think that, that going through that and, and as you're talking about resilience and realising that we as humans have an incredible reserve of resilience that you don't know you have until you're pushed your back up against the wall. And I, going, going through that and realising that, that learning to, to rely on myself and obviously I had uh, amazing people around me, friends and family to, to give me support, but, but really ultimately I had to, to dig deep into that well of resilience and, and find a way through it. And what I think that your pain teaches you is not just about yourself, but it gives you an incredible empathy and connection with other people, which I has really changed my life. That I feel like I am connected to people in a way that I wasn't before, because I understand the suffering, and everyone suffers in different ways. And our, our trauma, it can, one person's trauma can be on a different scale to another, but we all know what it's like to suffer. And for me, talking again about um, 
he was saying the worst thing that can happen to someone to, to lose a child. My best friend in Scotland did lose her child, a five-year-old boy um, who I talk about in the, the first book. Um, and he died very suddenly a few days before Christmas um, 2011. Um, and going through what I've gone through and, going, and watching what she has gone through, it's connected us in a way, and our experiences are completely different. But she, could, she knew when I was in that dark space what it was like to not be able to see your way through the next minute and find a way. And her life now, um, seven years on, will never be the same. But she's found a way. She says to me that she, people should never presume that she's, ever, she's over the loss of her child. But she's found a way. It is possible to, um, to live with a broken heart and find a way to find joy and happiness in the everyday. And she's done that. And the connection that I have with her and with people through that experience and the, the friendships and the, the relationships that I have as a result of going through something really awful has been a gift. And I think the anxiety that I struggle with even to this day is a gift. It's always teaching me something. And uh, that's not to say that people who are in dire needs don't, shouldn't have to go through that. And we have a mental health system that I could talk about endlessly about how broken it is. But I think... As you said, Brock, how do you measure your joy if you don't have anything to, to pit it against? And if we were just constantly going through life, living at our peak happiness, we would get tired of that pretty quickly, and we want more, and we want more, and we want more, and I find that out the hard way. So, so I, I think, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, yeah, the, uh, it's been a really long journey for me, and, and I've also realized that it's not a journey that finishes at the end of a few sessions of therapy. For me, it's a lifelong journey of, of learning. And I think that's not what we're taught as kids. We're taught that, that when, you, when you experience pain, emotional pain, you, you need to get it fixed and it will be short-lived and then it's over and then you're cured. That's not what it's like to be human. Mm. And Brock, that's something that you talk about in your book too, about the uh, importance of connection with others. Mm. Um, some people just, it feels like some people just flourish in life um, and they, don't, they seem to have it all together. Mm. Why is that? You're so annoying, those people. That's so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a million dollar question. If we, had, if we had the answer to that, we, all be, uh, we, we wouldn't be here probably. Um, yeah, I, I mean, look, I don't know. It, 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 I, I think that there are a number of factors. Um, again, positive psychology has been good at identifying some of those key strengths that people need to flourish well in life. Um, I think there's quite quite a number. I, I think the idea, you know, as Mark pointed out, that, that people can can bounce back from experiences quickly, that, that agility to move back into, you know, or, or to deal or respond to things, because things do happen, and those some of those feelings do occur, but it's how we respond to them that matters. So. So yeah, I mean, it's it's again, it's it's you know, it's another one of those hard questions. But um, I, I think I think there are there are multiple factors. But I, I would say that you know, probably one of the key things is is being able to um, respond well to to a range of life events and being able to accommodate those events. And I do think that when when we when we set up expectations, really across the board, that's often where we go wrong. And and I think also, you know, the, the fact is we're not, we're not setting those up on our own. You know, we, we live in an environment, in a social environment, where, you know, there's, a, there's people who are paid big money to set those expectations up for us um, endlessly and continuously. And living in that environment can be very problematic and, and, and we're not immune to it. And sometimes we don't even realise we're being affected by it. But I do think that that plays a very big role as well. You know, one of the things, to go back to your first question, levels of mental illness in uh, Australia and America are significantly higher than in some other countries. And that certainly can't be explained by GDP or other kinds of you know, basic, um, you know, I guess, concrete well-being, if you like, or objective measures of well-being. So there is something going on there in our societies, and, and, I, and, I, and I think it needs to be understood and explained at that level of, of culture and society a little bit as well. So, um, yeah, mm. yeah. Mark, who are the most satisfied people in Australia? <laughs> There's too many of them. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, mean, I know this is not this is the focus of this topic. We're supposed to focus on, the, you know, the happy people. Uh, and because we did last time, we did the unhappy people. But it, it is easier to talk about the people at the other end, okay, because they're a smaller group. I mean, just for this talk, I pulled out some numbers. And what I did was I took all the people in our survey today who've done it five years in a row. So admittedly, that means I've dropped a few people, maybe some of the more miserable people. Okay, and I looked at who are the people who are persistently saying 
that they're dissatisfied with their life. Okay, scoring naught, heaven forbid naught, that's really bad, naught to five on, on the scale, and about 4% of them said this three, th at least three times, you know, out of our last three, five interviews, at least three, three or four or five times, okay? So it's about 4% of all Australians, you know, and I weighted up, okay? Might sound like a small group, but don't forget our unemployment rate's 5%, so 4%, it sounds like it's still a significant number. And who are these people? Well, a lot of them have some sort of disabling health condition, 50% of them. Okay, who have a long-term health condition that they say limits their work, okay, in some way, okay. A lot of them not employment, of course. They've got disabling work conditions, but there's a lot of, so it is a lot of uh, people there who are not employed. Um, they do, but this is not necessarily causal because it could be a function of the non-employment and disability. They do live in households with low income. And they're welfare dependent. And they also tend to be people, there's a lot of variation here, but they tend to be people who lack social networks, who lack um, those support mechanisms, you know, a lot of single people or, you know, who don't have the support mechanisms, that may be what helps you get through um, tough times. So, I mean, this, these are the people who are, uh, who, who are the least satisfied, isn't it? The rest of us, um, whether we're happy or not, I can't say that, but we, um, we uh, seem quite content on a sort of a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. So I wonder if we could um, just finish up and, and get an idea from each of you about what you would suggest are the key strategies that we could focus on to, to lift our level of sense of not happiness, but a sense of satisfaction and well-being in life. So I wonder, Jill, first of all. Well, that's a big question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so the entire second part of my book is about the the way that I've learned to, to live a, a more meaningful and calmer, more connected life. And there's a number of things there. Um, there's a lot of science behind a lot of the things that I've looked at, the science of compassion for yourself and for others. We're a lot happier, we're a lot calmer when we show compassion to people. And that's very difficult in a very divided world, but we're actually hardwired to be kind and it lowers our blood pressure, it makes us, um, it, 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 it makes, actually makes us live longer if we can show compassion to particularly people who we disagree with, which is difficult, I think, a lot. But um, the, the science around play, the art of play, like when we were children, we, we run with abandon, we, we, we dance, we, we don't care what anyone thinks we look like, and then we grow old, uh, we grow older, and we, we start to have this weight of responsibility and a weight of duty, and we don't want to look foolish. And I just have thrown that completely out the window. So now, like I, you quite often find me dancing in Princess Park on my, <laughs> on my own when I go for a run, and I feel like a, a song comes on that I'm listening to, and I want to dance. I will just dance and like let that little child part of me that wants to run off the leash like a dog at a dog park just. And the, and the science behind that is really strong as well. Um, one of the other things I think is really important for me is to, to embrace my flaws, to realise that I'm human, to, to not try and hide the scars that make me who I am. So in, I talk about in, in Happy Never After, I look at kintsugi, which is the Japanese art of repairing broken pottery with powdered gold. So in, in, in that philosophy, they make the broken beautiful, and it's in those, those seams of gold that hold the vase together that, that make us who we are. So for me, that's, that's a kind of philosophy for, for life now is to, I have a bag that I bought from the School of Life that says emotional baggage written in big letters on the side of it. I carry that around a lot as well because, you know, we all have emotional baggage. The trick is to carry it elegantly. <laughs> Peggy, what would you suggest? Uh, so, you know, we have focused a lot on sort of some of those perhaps misperceptions we have about happiness and, and what the good life really is. Um, so I, I think part, part of it is actually kind of readjusting what our goal actually is. It's actually about living well as opposed to perhaps living happily. And what we do see with that is a lot of that is... is a li little things that we do actually can make a difference. Uh, you know, things like playing in the park or, uh, you know, interacting with other people, our social connections, having real connections with others, not necessarily having thousands and thousands of friends, but actually 
having time to connect with real friends, uh, taking time to notice and appreciate the good things in us and around us, having compassion for ourselves and for others. It's those little things that actually are a way of life and a way of thinking that can actually help us feel good and function well or accept when we're not feeling well and to kind of take the highs and lows together. Mark. Uh, way outside my field now, so <laughs> anything I say should probably take with a grain of salt. Uh, <laughs> my concern, I guess, well, my concern, what can we do better? Um, can we do better at detecting early the sorts of people who are going to have problems later in life? So it seems to me this is early childhood is where we've got to start. And so, who, so they've got the parents, but what if the parents are part of the problem? Um, um, and so then you've got early childhood and schools, okay? Um, but at the same time, you know, we don't want schools to, but it seems to me these are the mechanisms. I mean, I don't know whether all our school teachers now have to become psychologists but, but, and therapists, but it seems to me that's where a lot of the problems uh, first will emerge. And do you need to detect it early? I mean, this is, I mean, the economists have come late to, to the psychology game. James Heckman telling you that you know, it's, <laughs> life success is all determined in your first sort of uh, three years. Okay, so I guess this is sort of along those lines. I don't know. The, the psychologists are all nodding. This is good. Okay, yeah, good, good, okay good. My, anxiety, my anxiety levels <laughs> just dropped. <laughs> I'm just to reiterate what Mark is saying. I totally agree. And I, I look in length, at length in this book about the, the early childhood years and I've gone through a lot of therapy, still in therapy. I think we should all have therapy, particularly Donald Trump needs a lot of therapy. Um, <laughs> too late, family. Too late, but you know, that, that, those, those early, 90% of the brain's development happens before the age of five, right? And so that, I traced a lot of my modern day anxiety as a 40 something woman back to those first few years and, and, and it was extraordinary what I, what I find. So I absolutely agree that, that if we could, if we could allow children, it's not necessarily putting them in therapy as children, but allow them, when this is happening more in schools, which is good, to actually express how they're feeling and to acknowledge that it's okay to not feel happy all the time. That would play a really big part, I think, in, in building more resilient generation. So, Brock, finally. Yeah, sure. I don't know if it's the final answer, but... Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I think, I think one of the things that um, psychology has done is, and, and, you know, prior to positive psychology, is to help people to understand how to p help people to cope when they fall down. Mm. And, and what that requires is a, is a really uh, quite acute sense of self-awareness. You need to be self-aware to be able to know how to pick yourself back up, how to regulate your emotions, how to get your thinking straight, how to get back on track. But then I, then I think one of the places we've gone wrong is we've, we've sometimes promoted that, that self-awareness beyond that point. And, and so we've, we've kind of thought that the way to be happy is to be more and more self-aware aware of how we're feeling from moment to moment, aware of you know, whether or not we're, we're achieving the things or the goals in life that we want to achieve. Um, but, but at the end of the day, it's actually sometimes a lack of self-awareness that actually is where you find the things that make you really happy. It's the times when you're not self-aware in the park dancing, you know, and, and that, that's when you, you, you're no longer aware of you, you being there, but you're engaged fully. Or it's, or it's you know, engaging in other people rather than yourself where you find a sense of meaning and purpose, being, you know, doing things for others rather than doing things for yourself. So I, I think in some ways letting go of that self-awareness at some point is really important and, and maybe, yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. So look, please join me. A big thank you to the wonderful panellists. <laughs> Associate Professor Brock Bastian, Mark Wooden, Peggy Kern and Jill Stark. Thank you so much.